just checking in and we'll get started in just three minutes.
Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Nikki Sandoval. I'm the Associate Vice President of Career Services and Alumni Relations at University of Maryland University College. And we are so thrilled to have all of you here joining us today in person and for those of you joining us online for today's Decoding Your Cyber Career. So we have a very special guest that I'm honored to introduce today, Dr. Richard Sokovanik. And he has worked in industry as a quality control manager in the carbide sector before assuming his teaching and administration duties in the community college system. He's also worked for over 25 years in the community college system. During this time, he has facilitated learning in mathematics, physics, chemistry, physical science, earth and space science, industrial science classes, and has served for 11 years as the chair of the physical sciences department. He is currently the Director of Interdisciplinary Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, ISTEM, network here at Montgomery College. He has extensive experience in a variety of STEM disciplines and program development, instructional technology, grant work, workforce development, teaching preparation, and development K-12 outreach. He also has his Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering and a Master's of Science degree in Physics and a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction. Dr. Serkovanek led as Executive Director as well for the uh, National STEM Consortium in its startup phase of a 19.7 million TAACCT grant, which developed one-year certificates in technician pathways connected to workforce needs, and at the same time was a community college institutional lead for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation grant T-STEM partnerships at UMBC. This is a national model for STEM transfer success. Rich is also currently leading as one of the PIs on Montgomery College's 5.6 million America's Promise Grant, which is titled the Capital Region Collaborative Jobs and Technical Careers, which tops off the professional and advancement content skills emerging professionals need for high-skilled occupations in IT-related and cybersecurity industries. Dr. Sokovanik was also the Interim Consortium Director of the 15 Million Cybersecurity Pathways Across Maryland project that included 14 Maryland community colleges. Will you please thank you and welcome Dr. Sokovanik. All right, well, th thank you very much. You left off the most important one is I'm an adjunct professor at UMUC. Uh, so I'm very proud of that. All right, uh, I am here today to welcome you to the Decoding Your Cyber Career, uh, sponsored by UMUC and Montgomery College. Uh, so I'd like to, on behalf of the Vice President of STEM and the Provost of Germantown Campus, welcome you to uh, the, the Montgomery College of Germantown Campus. Uh, we are currently right now in the Bioscience Education Building, uh, which hosts the Biotechnology Program here at the college. Uh, which uh, boasts uh, industry-grade equipment such as bioreactors and gene sequencers, as well as a complete uh, biomanufacturing suite that our students get to work through in the biotech area. Uh, just a few buildings down and, and down the hill a little bit uh, is our high-tech building, uh, which houses our uh, Montgomery College Cybersecurity uh, Center, uh, which has a state-of-the-art cybersecurity lab, uh, and the Security Operations Center, a SOC, uh, that our students get to use. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do today is, is thank you, uh, the participants especially, for coming here today. Uh, please make the, the most of it of today's work. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, certainly UMUC for their sponsorship and their partnership, uh, and Mr. Joe Roundy for uh, of Montgomery College uh, Cyber Center uh, for his coordination and uh, logistics uh, today. Certainly want to thank all the speakers, the panelists, the industry representatives, uh, the advisors, and all the other supportive folks who are here today for you. Uh, so, so please see them, talk to them, uh, get their help. They're here just for you. Uh, I would uh, also lastly like to thank that we are doing this today and not tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or else Joe would have a lot more logistics to have to do. All right, uh, so with that, thank you. Have a great, great day, and uh, I'll hand you back to Nikki. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it.
appreciate the partnership with uh, Montgomery College. So it's my also pleasure to introduce today's event host, Mike Janke. Mike is a six-time founder, accomplished entrepreneur, and former member of the SEAL Team 6. Mike also is a co-founder of Data Tribe, which is a unique startup studio and venture capital firm specializing in commercial technology startups, and is focused on cybersecurity and data science. Data Tribe companies are built around technology developed by intelligence agencies, defense, and research uh, labs that are to solve large problems using over-the-horizon technology. Data Tribe's hand-on approach includes co-building startups alongside founders in the Data Tribe facility. In addition to Data Tribe, Mike is a co-founder of Blue Pacific Studios, an LA-based media uh, content production company that he founded along with Daniel Wien Wienand, the founder of Shopify. And Mike was the co-founder of Silent Circle, which delivers private security communication hardware and software worldwide, and the founder of Blackphone, the world's first mainstream commercial secure Android smartphone. Mike is a board member of Data Tribe, Dragos, OP2 Labs, MindBridge AI, Blue Pacific Studios, and Prevalon. Will you please join me in welcoming Mike Janke. All right. Well, the beauty of being in tech is you can dress like a bum like I do. That's the important part, right? <laughs> The interesting part about technology is that you can be anything you want. I'm a former SEAL Team 6 member that, for all intent and purposes, had no business being a six-time technology CEO. So there are components of technology that have nothing to do with race, sex, religion, where you come from, it has to do with ideas, building a team, and really taking a risk. So for the first 10 minutes before I introduce our guest, let me tell you a little bit about this area. Because in this crowd we have students, we have entrepreneurs, we have faculty members, we have business owners, we have a large mix. In the past, this area when I say this area, I mean Virginia, D.C., and Maryland, was very bad. There was a few wins here and there, um, mostly focused over the last 10 years on government services. Technology, don't get me wrong, but government services. However, this area has become something very, very unique. The commercial cybersecurity and data science is booming faster than any other place in the United States over the last three years. There are a lot of parallels to what happened in Silicon Valley in the early days to here. In Silicon Valley, if a lot of people know the history, I spend my time between both here and there. During World War II, there was a tremendous amount of university research, development, PhD, put into signals intelligence, radar, microprocessing, yes, and weaponry out of Berkeley and, and Stanford. After the war, you have 30,000 scientists who have no job, right? So they began to take upon their work into commercial. It's where microprocessors and then computers and cell phones and everything came about. This area is very similar. You have the NSA. You have Cybercom. You have Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. You have DISA, CIA. You have universities like UMUC and the University of Maryland system that for the first time ever in 2017 graduated more cyber-related engineers than California. First time. 7,208, I know that number. So you see you've got this groundswell of tens of billions of government investment, just like happened during World War II. Now you're seeing the commercialization. 
What we do is we invest lots of money into teams that come out of the intelligence and research, and we work with them to build top cutting edge commercial companies funded by Silicon Valley in here. This area is literally the epicenter of cybersecurity. At any one time through Maryland and Virginia, there are 17,000 open jobs in cybersecurity. 17,000. Across our portfolio at Data Tribe, with companies D round, C round, B round in investment, we have 58 open positions we can't fill at any one time. Right? So, to those students who are here looking at a career choice, you couldn't find something better where people were begging you to please finish up your degree to come in. Now, a lot of people have asked me, well, do you need a degree? I watch Silicon Valley on HBO. They seem like cool kids. Um, you know, they're smoking dope and hacking and making a lot of money. You do need a degree. You'll meet our next guest, who was the chief information officer of one of the largest Fortune 500 companies, hiring people. Um, CISOs and certain corporations are looking for. You have to be able to know the job, but a degree is important. So I just wanted to send that message, talk a little bit about the area. And now I'm going to introduce my guest that we're going to have a little fireside chat. Clark Golistani. Clark has over 30 years of experience in health, life sciences, and technology, and is an active investor, advisor, and board member with a focus on healthcare, technology, media, and telecommunications sector. Clark currently serves as the managing director of C Sensei Group, LLC. It's an advisory services firm, and he serves as a senior advisor to New Mountain Capital, based in New York City and is an investment advisor to the CXO Fund, which is a really, really unique venture firm in Silicon Valley. And he's also a special advisor to the dean at the University of Texas at Austin at the Dell Medical School. Clark retired from Merck in 2018 as the president of Emerging Business and the Global CIO, with responsibilities for Merck's portfolio of digital health services, and solutions companies inclusive of the company's venture and its equity funds, each of which extensively leveraged further opportunity across the digital health ecosystem. Further, Clark led the company's global information technology organization, strategy, and execution worldwide, spanning all lines of business. So with that, I'd like to introduce Clark Golistani, and we're going to do a little fireside chat here. Thanks. path to how you ended up as the CIO of one of the largest companies in the world. Yeah, no, ha happy to share that. Um, so I, uh, I did graduate. Um, <laughs> there you go. Much to the, uh, much to the happiness of my, uh, my parents, uh, because when I was actually uh, at university, which I, I was at MIT, I did uh, do a startup. Uh, it was probably my late sophomore year, and uh, uh, that was booming up until uh, the late 80s. Does anyone know what happened in the late 80s? Stock market crashed. Venture dried up. And so did the company. Uh, but I did stay very focused on making sure that I, I did graduate, and I did. Uh, and then I went to work for another startup at the time, uh, which is a company that uh, has grown quite well. Uh, and I was with them for six years in the late 80s into the mid-90s called Oracle. So most folks in the room probably know Oracle, so I was there during the well. early days and growing. Uh, from there, I, I then uh, went to Merck, uh, became uh, part of the IT organization and managing technology uh, globally. And uh, over 24 years, uh, ended up uh, working my way up and then running a good part of the organization. That's great. So we got a few questions. Um, the idea here of the questions for Clark is to both hit from the student question ideas, both to an entrepreneur, and to some of the business side, then we'll, we'll round off with about 15 minutes of Q&A, right? So 
Save your questions. If you got some good questions, uh, Clark will be taking them here in a little bit. All right. So describe the emerging cyber landscape in the Mid-Atlantic region. And everybody calls the Mid-Atlantic region, you know, D.C., Virginia, Maryland, part of Pennsylvania, and a little south. Yeah, so, well, uh, first from a cyber perspective, uh, when I think about where we would recruit uh, talent, this actually was a, a primary area that talent would be recruited from. What's interesting, though, in cyber is that, uh, especially being uh, based in New Jersey uh, at, at Merck, uh, which is a pharmaceutical company, uh, across the river, if you will, in New York, over many years, we watched the Wall Street firms expand and really build up cyber capability, given some of the issues in banking. Uh, what's amazing is that very quickly uh, in the last five years, uh, just about every industry now has to build up its cyber capability. And in fact, when I think about the budget uh, that was being spent on cyber, uh, that budget over the last several years has almost doubled every 12 to 24 months. So one of the only areas of IT where the budget is growing at that rate where most IT budgets are staying flat, perhaps going a little bit down, or a couple of emerging technologies may be expanding. Cyber just continues to expand in the amount of uh, money that's spent, in the types of resources that uh, need to come in-house, and really is, uh, uh, I think, uh, an incredible area of expansion. Uh, and that's not just going to work for those companies, but also the service firms. And in fact, uh, one of the service firms Two of the service firms that uh, I use actually are based here uh, in this area and also service the government as well as I, I can tell you that in the past five years, cybersecurity is the fastest growing segment of technology per its market from where it started. Um, so when you match that up with the open job landscape where they're predicting by 2021 there'll be a million jobs unfilled in cyber. Uh, it's staggering. Um, so with that, if you're a student, from your perspective, forget the numbers and the job opportunities, why should they get a degree in cybersecurity or cyber? Well, so this is, this is a, 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 probably something that most folks are not aware of. Most major corporations will screen you out from the application process the moment that you don't have a degree. So if you were to apply to a Merck, a hiring manager wouldn't even see your resume unless you had a degree and there was a reasonable level of verification uh, that occurs through the recruiting office, uh, which is unfortunate because there's probably many talented individuals who could do the job that don't have the degree, but the reality is without the degree, you're immediately screened out so you're not even seen. And when it comes to cyber, uh, I actually do believe that the level of, of knowledge and the uh, technical capability uh, that you learn while getting that degree is essential. Some folks are self-taught, uh, but the reality is that the majority uh, really benefit from that, that formal training. And when you think about the risk that's involved uh, and the job, it's, you know, it's interesting when I think about SEAL team protecting the, comp uh, the country, um, that cyber team really protects the company. And I can speak to experiences where major corporations uh, really have been brought down due to cyber attacks. And it's only becoming more complicated every day. So uh, going through and really uh, learning all the details to be able to perform uh, the roles within the, the cybersecurity team are really essential. I think that's a great answer. Um, you know, five, six years ago, if a company was hacked, eh, made the news, yet, you know, a couple hundred million addresses taken. Mm. Nothing real drastic was done. Today, when companies are hacked, CEOs lose his job, stock gets cut in half, investors flee, reputation damage. It is akin to a hurricane hitting DC, the amount of damage. So this is why cybersecurity professionals within a company who would work under Clark are so prized, make the most amount of money, and honestly have the hardest job without a doubt. Um, so when you were recruiting, when you were looking to build that A team within, what kind of skills from this particular area did you prize or experience? So the, um, a technical base 
really having a, a computer science background, but also um, it was very helpful when folks were, were actually trained in cybersecurity or even had certifications. Uh, really essential, and it made the, the job quite easy then in hiring folks. Uh, and I can't speak loudly enough to um, the salary structure. It's interesting, the uh, folks who work in cyber every year ended up having to have special allotments oh, yeah. uh, because they would break the salary increase curves of the company. Uh, it's a fabulous place. So if you're beginning your career and cyber interests you, becoming certified, becoming educated, uh, it's a career that uh, also pays very well too, which can benefit you and your family. Yeah, and, and all of this, this changed within the last five to seven years, right? Um, there was a, it, people just called it IT in the past, you know, cyber security. Uh, the one thing I will tell you working with, you know, 200 of the Fortune 500 right now, CISOs, things have shifted a lot um, towards what I'll call the, the, the nation state, national security, intelligence community type background because corporations like Merck and others are no longer fighting the hacker in the hoodie in his mom's basement. They're still doing that. But it's, it's nation states like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea and others, or Eastern European hacking groups that are more well-funded than a university. So the adversary is so sophisticated that it is prized in this area. If you look at the Morgan Stanley, the JP Morgans, the Goldman Sachs, and on and on, that do look for somebody with the qualifications Clark highlighted, but also maybe spent four to five years at the NSA or Cybercom or, 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 or. Um, so it's interesting. The one comment Clark made, if you were old enough, you, you see that there are these troughs, right? Economy goes up, not a lot of venture money, we're in a recession, you know, things are good. Then you had the, the 2000s, you know, the bubble burst and things went up. Today's a little different age. Even in a downturn, the one area that they cannot cut, that they have to keep growing, is cybersecurity. I won't say anything's recession proof, but it's about as close as you're gonna get in, in a need. Um, so when, 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 when you looked at candidates, Clark, other than those, was there specific certifications that mattered more, or was it just a, uh, an overall body of, of uh, education and experience. Having deep technical skills and associated degrees is very helpful, but there, there were and, and are some cyber uh, certifications, and if folks have those, uh, uh, it's extremely valuable. And the reason why is I, I can't overemphasize how the game has changed in the last several years. So how many of you have heard of the NotPetya uh, attack? I see a couple of hands. It's worthwhile going back and taking a look at it. Uh, which is now a confirmed nation state attack, of which uh, Merck was impacted, so were uh, many corporations, um, Maersk, which is shipping, uh, Federal Express uh, in their European operation. And this was an attack that literally brought corporations to its knees. And in fact, many corporations that were impacted by it had to rebuild everything. And we're not talking 10 computers or 100 computers or 1,000 computers. We're talking tens of thousands of computers and needed to be rebuilt from scratch. And the cost of doing that is enormous just in the technology side. The impact to the corporation is huge in the cost because you're not shipping product. Now, depending on the business you're in, it also is a matter of life and death, especially when you're in the pharmaceutical business and people need their medicines to survive. So the impact and the risk is enormous. And now that the game has changed in the last few years, and it's actually become far more of a nation state game, corporations have to continue to invest and increase that investment. And then when you think about that certification, I, I can't overemphasize what you said. In fact, uh, some of our key individuals that have actually come in uh, as even the pharmaceutical businesses have increased their game in the cyber, have actually had uh, government training which is enormously helpful because they've actually seen things from the, the inside, if you will, that then can bring that knowledge to corporate America. That's a great, that's, that's great insight. Um, now what I'd like to do is kind of shift the landscape a little bit to more of the, uh, the cyber career landscape, right? I mean, there, there's a, a, a lot of noise out there 
especially if you're a student, right, where, where people are looking at, oh, my God. Here's what I can tell you. It doesn't matter if you went to Harvard, Georgia Tech, or a good cyber college that's small. It's about getting the degree, but it's also about some of the skills you learn and the ability to come out of the gate having an understanding of how uh, cyber works in a corporation or commercial software dev or DevSecOps. Um, what you're seeing today is there's a lot of marketing out there for computer science and other certain skills, but you want to really start looking into educations that are particularly fit what the industry is looking at. So Clark, from your perspective, what do you see kind of on the education landscape today, both the plus and the minus, and, and just any thoughts on um, the education today in, in cyber? Well, so I, I, you know, there's, uh, if I think about UMUC, for example, the cyber program uh, that was developed there, uh, those are extraordinarily helpful uh, when you're specifically trained in cybersecurity, and there's so many aspects of cyber today. It used to be where there would just be uh, a small cyber team that was dealing with all the problems. Now cyber extends all the way from the way that you're testing technologies, and there are aspects of testing, all the way into hunt teams that are constantly looking for issues, into aspects of the way telecom is managed. Today, when I think about the entire landscape of IT within a firm, as well as the technologies that you push out to customers and clients, which at Merck we also did. We pushed technology into hospitals and into clinics. The, the, all the aspects of cyber becomes one of the key risk factors in everything that we need to look at. So when I think about cyber, I actually see also subspecialties across the cyber landscape. What does it mean to actually understand and do testing of software with that aspect of cyber? What does it mean to actually go out and hunt and understand and find the problems across the landscape? What does it mean to actually manage telecommunications and the networking capability from a cyber dimension? And I could go on and on. There's many of these subspecialties. Uh, so the degree which you actually go for, uh, certainly it used to be have a broad comp sci perspective. That's very helpful. Having a cyber uh, perspective is extremely helpful. But then you can also subspecialize in the many of these areas. How have you, uh, we, we touched a little bit about this, but how have you seen the, uh, the cyber threat landscape as we discuss change, but where do you see it going, Clark? Where do you see the cyber threat landscape in the next year or three years? I know that's hard to tell, but what are your well, thoughts? Well, you know, it's interesting. We, we had a lot of conversations about this uh, within and across companies, especially after the last attack. And for those that uh, aren't aware of that attack, what that attack did was really, um, if you will, destroy a computer system by uh, erasing everything from the way that it would boot up. So all the data was gone. <coughs> and in fact, uh, an entire company uh, typically was destroyed within probably about two to three minutes. Uh, so it didn't take long to destroy uh, hundreds of thousands of computers. Um, we all sat back and, and thanked ourselves uh, that it actually was destroyed because you knew if the machine had a problem or not. Now just imagine, especially for a nation state, mm -hmm. if someone decides to write something, that goes in, changes data a little bit, and then disappears. Maybe it goes back and changes data a little bit more, and then disappears. Imagine that through the financial sector or through life sciences, where people's lives depend on it, or hospital systems. That, my fear, is coming. And that is why I think when I look at cyber, the ability to alter data and do that in a way that is undiscovered, that may take weeks, months, years to surface, or call into question the credibility. Imagine if you opened up your bank statements, and all of a sudden something didn't quite look right, but it was, it, then reported, how are you gonna, you gotta go back, and how many of you keep a printed copy of your bank statement? I'm amazed at how many people say no, I just have it electronically, right? And this is true of many things. That is where I see it, it going, especially it's nation state, and you know, 
frankly, it's a lot cheaper to build a, a cyber offensive capability than it is to run a, a missile program. And because of that, I think the game is going to continue to increase and become far more dangerous. And with that, there will be far more professionals that are needed to combat it. I think that's a, it's a really good vision, and it's, and it's happening already, the, the early stages of what Clark just outlined. Um, one of our companies, Dragos, uh, is probably the world's leading industrial control cyber company. This is power grids, wind, nuke, but also Campbell Soup, American Airlines, BASF, right? Anywhere there is automated manufacturing, they call that OT as opposed to IT. For the first time ever, a nation state directed a hack to the energy sector in Saudi Arabia that was designed to cost lives, to blow up things. You know, you see a lot in the press this fear, oh my God, the entire East Coast is going to go dark. Eh, not really, right? We're, we got pretty well bifurcated systems. But a lot of the new attack vector, vector uh, by nation states is, is in the uh, uh, industrial control area. Look, General Foods, General Mills, who makes your breakfast cereal, right? they were hacked, and it literally cost them billions of dollars because all it did was stop up production. Clark mentioned it earlier. You're not shipping product, right? But if it comes to a nuke plant or any type of energy producing, you can cost lives, right? And it's a, it's a different, cybersecurity still applies. Hunt teams, the whole nine yards. It's just a little different AO. And so you're seeing a lot of that start to happen. Um, and a lot of technology is, is being directed to it. Uh, I agree with Clark. Um, things aren't getting nicer. They're getting scarier. Uh, the stakes are higher, right? I think we're all numb right now. If I said, let me pull out my phone, oh my God, Nike was hacked. Anybody who bought shoes on Nike, their credit card information, the hackers have it. You, at this point, you'd be like, yeah, so what? They got it from Yahoo, they got it from Experian, OPM, Sony. Uh, I don't have any information left to give to the bad guys, right? So the public gets kind of somewhat numbed from all of this repetitive. Um, but this is why at UMUC and places like this that are, that are considered specialists in creating some of the top cybersecurity professionals will be, continue to be more relevant than others. All right. so. We talked about a lot about the, the cyber threat concerns that we see. Uh, so this is, this is one that is unique, but I'd love to hear Clark's view on it. What can individuals do to protect their personal and professional data from an attack? You know, this is an interesting one um, because uh, m most companies and probably uh, universities too are trying to train everyone to be more aware and cognizant of the risks and the actions that they can take. Um, how many of you have installed a router in your house? Did you all change the password? That's good. Now, it's interesting when we ask that question inside a corporation, about half the folks say, what password? Pretty scary. Or they said, oh, no, 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 the service provider installed it. They didn't even change the password after they left. Um, so there's a whole set of basic things that everyone can do to be incredibly vigilant, which stops 80% of the problems. And especially from an individual level, we'll, we experience a, uh, you know, a nation state attack individually, no. May we get caught up in something like that? Possibly. But by doing that level of diligence across everything that we do, and then also taking the extra step to ask the question to your parents, to your neighbors, that will actually create a far more safer world for your data as well as everyone around you, which also can affect you. I think that's, that's a great answer. All right, so um, you heard enough from me. Let's get some questions for Clark. Uh, you can ask any question you want. Um, if it were on career, what was it like uh, being the CIO of a major corporation? 
questions about the path. It could be about an entrepreneur. Sir, please, stand up if you would. We'll give you a microphone here so everybody can hear you. Hi. Um, I'm here with my daughter, actually trying to get her into cybersecurity, so that's just a little background. You talked about certifications and you talked about degrees. You know, you said it's good to get a degree. And you also mentioned certifications. Can you explain a little bit about that? Should you get a certification on your way to a degree? Should you get certifications after you get a degree? How do you sort of, you know, put those two together? Certifications versus yep. So um, I, I view, so when I think about the degree, and especially when I think about the advanced degree that UMC offers, that's sort of the, I, I look at that as like the golden ticket. Um, once you've got, uh, let's say, an undergraduate degree, I think there are a set of certifications that you can get to demonstrate that you're proficient, both in cyber as well as the underlying technology, being certified in the underlying technology. But doing an advanced degree in cyber, I think that is the, that is the golden ticket. And anyone that's going to really, I think, uh, form a complete career around cyber should think about doing that. Um, the reality is CISOs, who used to be buried in organizations, now minimally report to the CIO. And if, even if you're in banking, you're all the way up at the risk level, quite often reporting to the CEO. So having those advanced degrees as you pursue that type of a, a cyber uh, career, I think is tremendously important, and I think can carry you a very long way uh, as you go through your career. That's a great answer. Okay, another question. We have, uh, sir. Over here. Go ahead, stand up if you would. Oh, there he is. Thank you. Um, I have three questions, actually. So the first question is I've been doing some research on, uh, on the market and cybersecurity. And especially in the DMV area, it looks like uh, most of the jobs uh, require some type of clearance. So my question is, are there still enough uh, opportunities for those folks like me who does not have uh, the requirement to obtain a clearance right now. Um, and the other question I have is... Well, hold on. Let's, let's take one at a time. one at a time. Yeah. So... I think I can take this one. Go ahead. You don't have to have a clearance when you graduate. Most organizations will be like, yeah, you've got the golden ticket, the degree. We're going to get you cleared even before you start to graduate. So don't worry about that. Uh, it's like everybody has to get a clearance at some point, right? Um, it'll be a function of your job. But what you're seeing is now the other side with Amazon and all these commercial cybersecurity firms, you don't necessarily have to get one if, if you're just looking what's out there. But if the, the Raytheon, the Lockheeds, the Boeings, the Mantex, whoever, They'll be recruiting you. They'll, they'll white glove that for you, right? So, so don't, don't make that be a worry. If there's any yeah, no, I was, was going to echo exactly what you said. On the commercial side, uh, a clearance is nice, especially in some of the uh, partnership activities that go on with government. Um, but even on the government side, yeah. um, they white glove it. And in fact, even on the commercial side, when there's interaction that needs to happen with the government and clearances are needed, some folks in my cyber organization had clearances. Those were even white gloved. Okay, thank you. So um, in the market, unrelated studies from prior education, does the, do they help? Uh, for example, I have a master's in global politics and uh, I don't know how it's gonna help me with the cyber security degree or associates degree that I'm gonna obtain. Uh, do they help in the well, market? Well, so I'll, I'll give you a perspective. Um, the, when you look at cyber, <clears throat> there's certainly the technical aspects of the role, but there's also the, the uh, calculating of the risk. Uh, one of the uh, uh, key questions that came from the board of directors is please characterize geopolitically all of the risks and all the actors. Okay, for my technical analyst, that was a very difficult question to answer. Probably with your training and background, you would have had a better opportunity at answering that question. So I think uh, when you think about cyber, one needs to elevate it up to what does it mean to manage risk? And then certainly there's all the technical aspects, but 
having other areas of expertise can certainly help play into the way that you manage risk. Yeah, I would second that. I mean, if uh, all things being equal, uh, there are two with equal capability and degrees coming out, and you have a master's that's in political and you've done some other things, I'll choose that because uh, it shows you're more well-rounded. Because it's not just binary. You just don't show up and sit at a computer, right? There's all kinds of interaction with senior executives, with vendors. and So having, having a little seasoned experience behind you really helps. All right. Where, where are we at? This gentleman was standing first. Please, go ahead. Right behind you. He's coming over. There you go. So, does, I think cybersecurity only involves like protecting data and, and code and all of that. Does it also involve other things such as like footage of security cameras and uh, and uh, like secure other forms, like security. <laughs> yeah, I got it. No, no, I got it. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, it, it covers just about everything. So under Clark's job, every camera in that building has firmware. It reports in, it's, a, it's what's called an endpoint. That phone in your pocket would be Clark's responsibility, right? The anything that is passing digits, bits and digits, is encompassing. Today, it's also cars, right? When you start thinking of a fleet of cars that are automated, that are sending data up and people are, Wi-Fi, okay? Smart TVs. The landscape that cyber has to cover is endless. Great question, I'll let Clark uh, expound a little on that. Well, it's interesting. So if you think about computing, you know, it used to be the mainframe computer, right? And it was one. And then we went to more distributed computers, and then there were tens and hundreds. And then we got PCs, and now you got thousands. And now you have I iPhones and all these devices, and we're to tens of thousands. And now we ha are about to embark on uh, rapidly going into the sensor revolution. Yeah where uh, it used to be where someone would say, do you have two iPhones on you? And a lot of hands would go up and you actually have two phones and one for work, one personal. But now when you actually look at an individual and the number of sensors, or if you walk into a factory floor, the amount of sensors that are giving back data is incredible. So we went from the tens to the thousands to the hundreds of thousands. We are now into millions of endpoints that need to be protected in any given company. And when you think about that, whether it's the cameras or the sensors, all of that needs protection. And by goodness, you know, I, I'm just thankful I'm sort of on the retirement <laughs> yeah. side because my, my head starts to blow up oh, when I think about God. tens of millions and hundreds of millions, which is where it's going. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's mind-boggling. Oh, question yes. over here. Question over here. Where are we at? Oh, got it. Go ahead, sir. So... I wanted to ask, if you have certifications and you do not have a degree in the field of cybersecurity, um, there usually is a roadblock. And then if you are coming from somewhere, let's say, I used to work in retail and now I work as an IT support technician. I got server certifications, but then when you were applying for a job, they would ask for so many years of experience. I might not have the years of experience, but I have the ability to understand and actually do the work. Why is that such a big roadblock, and why is that put when you're trying to apply for a job? So from a corporate perspective, most companies um, um, put in place certain screens, and degrees are just one of those screens. I think that you'll find that a lot of service organizations uh, will uh, probably take individuals that are not degreed, uh, but I think you'll find that most of corporate America will just require the degree. Uh, that's been my experience when talking with colleagues. One, one thing I would add to that, you know, I, I, I know a lot of good young hackers uh, that, that 
might work at an MSSP or something. With today, with universities like UMUC, there's no reason you couldn't get a degree right after dinner at night, working hours, right, to put that in. It broadens your ability. And by the way, just like this gentleman asked here, when you get that degree, you're worth more than others who don't have your experience. Because you're a plus plus, right? So don't look at it as what I don't have today. If you get that degree, you're further ahead on a candidate list than others because of what you did in IT for those years. Does that make sense? Okay, we've got, sir. Uh, hi, uh, so you were talking about uh, certifications and getting experience as well. I know in other fields, let's say political science or uh, even the other sciences, um, they, they encourage students to get internships. So I'm curious, is it possible to get an internship uh, even though you don't have the certification? just at least to get your, um, just to feel comfortable before you can apply for a full-time job and say, I do have this experience and I do have this certification and I do have this degree. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, because the cyber uh, field is so competitive with so many unfilled jobs, when you're working towards a degree in cyber and then you're applying for an internship, um, companies want you because they want to get that experience with you during your internship so that when you graduate, they're there with an offer to hire you. And hopefully, if you've had some experience inside the company, you like the people you've worked around and you're going to preference taking the job with that company. So absolutely, when, you can, when you're demonstrating that you're working towards that degree, I would highly encourage you to look for the internships. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's great. There's a young lady. Oh, go ahead. Hello. I'd like to uh, say thank you guys for coming out today and uh, speaking with us. Um, my question really gets back to um, what you brought up, uh, Mr. Janke, about um, there being one million job opportunities by 2020. Um, it's historically, or there's been uh, studies that humans are really uh, bad at recognizing cybersecurity events. So that's causing the industry to kind of transition to machine learning and automation. Uh, I'd just like to see your perspectives on how that's going to affect the cybersecurity industry if, if we're going to continue to push uh, machine learning in, in a way uh, that it, it automates these and recognizes these uh, breaches and vulnerabilities or vectors. Um, it's a that, great question, actually. Thank you. I'll let. Yeah, so I think with the volume of data that's coming in, uh, there would be no way that humans would even be able to um, address that. Uh, I don't see uh, AI and machine learning as a replacement for the humans because <clears throat> the reality is those will um, be applied to being able to sift through the data better, but my experience is that there's a layer of humans that need to apply a lot of experience in making sure that the actions that are being taken make sense. And the amount of, uh, you know, all the AI and ML in the world isn't going to go ahead and create upgrades and communicate with organizations on upgrade schedules and educate them and look at new technologies that need to be deployed. I could just keep going on and on and on, which is why when you look at hiring within any company, the cyber organization keeps going like this and the number of people that are coming in, not only as full-time employees, but also as third parties uh, to get the work done. Uh, so I, I just see it as a necessary augmentation uh, to be effective. I don't think it will replace jobs whatsoever. I, I agree. Mo most of the, uh, I won't say most, I'll say probably 50% of the cybersecurity products out there claim some form of ML or AI. And, and, and it could be a, just a couple ML alg algorithms that do something, right? It's not like a lot of the fears, well, oh, AI is going to replace the factory worker robots. Cyber is very different. There will be certain processes and procedures. Yeah, a machine can be trained on. But in some ways, it's causing more need for people. You heard what Clark said earlier about the endpoints just keep growing. Uh, a friend of mine, Don Duet, used to be the, the CTO of Goldman Sachs. He said, Go, people don't know, Goldman Sachs isn't a financial company. We're an engineering company. We have 9,000 engineers. We're a data company. Ford, the truck company, talk to their CTO. They're a data company. 
every year, the amount of data that they pull in doubles or triples. All right, so they become a data company. AI, ML, just, just the certain parts of it. Um, so it's not like there's a robot that's going to take over. People are the most important part of cybersecurity, not necessarily the products. And people use the products, that's all. Uh, but that's a great question because I've had that before and it's actually hard to articulate because people can pick up a Wired magazine, anything else, and it says the robots are coming. All these auto factory workers will be gone. Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah, that, that's true. But cybersecurity is very different. I'd just be careful with all the predictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That are in the magazines, yeah. right? I think you're so right. But just have fun. Go back to the 60s and look exactly. at popular science of popular mechanic. You know, we'd all be in flying cars right now. That's right. right. Yeah. We go ahead. We've got one more question time left. I'm sorry. That that lady's been standing since the get go. Please. Didn't think I saw you. Um, so I don't think age will play in whatsoever to it. Um, and and frankly, you're looking at a career change. Please do that. We need more women in cybersecurity. Being um, so, no, not at all. And I actually believe um, doing the degree work will help in creating that transition, right? Regardless of what career you're in. Uh, there's a number of these uh, at uh, at Merck that looked to do the career transition, not just from IT, but actually from our businesses, because as we deployed that program that educated people in cyber, there were folks in the commercial parts of the operation and manufacturing that found a new calling in life. And they Um, at this time, again, thank you both for your time. Um, at this time, I am very excited to introduce someone that many of you may know already, Mr. Joe Rundy, who's going to lead us through a live security hack demonstration. Uh, but first, I'd like to share a little bit with you about Joe. Um, he is the Cybersecurity Program Manager for Montgomery College. He has his Master's of Computer Systems Management from UMUC and a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science also from UMUC. Joe has over 30 years experience in operational IT, more than half in what is now called cybersecurity. And in 2015, Joe completed the modernization of the internet uh, available cybersecurity lab here at Montgomery College. He is a faculty mentor for the MC Cybersecurity Club. He hosts high school and Maryland community college competitions and is an AFA Cyber Patriot mentor for Montgomery County Public Schools. He's also a recipient of the SANS Difference Maker Award and is currently the principal investigator on NSF CyberCorp Scholarship for Service Award. And in his spare time, he is a trainer for the Baltimore Cyber Range. Please join me in welcoming Joe Rundy. Uh, so I have some uh, voluntold students here who are going to help us demonstrate some of the things that should you decide to pursue a degree at Montgomery College or UMUC uh, in cybersecurity or IT. Some of the things that uh, not only you will learn to do, but you will understand how it's done. Uh, just for those of you who may be nervous, we don't, we don't teach them how to hack, but we do teach them some of the tools that are used and we teach them how to secure systems so that they are less vulnerable to hacks. So we, here we have, go ahead, uh, here we have, uh, what's your name? Chris, Chris and Dan. 
Chris, the first thing we do when you, if you were to be an attacker, a hacker, is you want to do some reconnaissance. Do you have it up? Oh, uh, excuse me. Obi. Excuse me. I really dislike passwords. I have like 20 of them. You know, you go to this account or that account or another account. And it can be a little frustrating. Uh, so the first thing we do is reconnaissance, right? So the, we have to find targets. Uh, Chris is going to use one of the tools that we teach here uh, to actually do some in, what we call enumeration. Dun, 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 dun. You know how on TV and the movies this stuff happens like lightning fast? None of that is real. Uh, I don't get you know I I don't get to watch movies with my wife because she'll say stop talking when I say that's not real. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, Baloney, baloney, it's not the actual term I use, but anyways. So Chris is going to start some enumeration here, and then once we get that up and running, we are then going to um, bring up um, Jason, who's going to actually going to exploit a target. That would be Dan over here. Uh, and he is, I don't know if you can all see his screen over here, but he's connected to his laptop here, and uh, we're going to actually gain access to it. Some of this might be familiar to some of you if you've ever used uh, Metasploit, Armitage, or any of those tools. Anybody here familiar with the Kali distribution? Okay, a few people. Um, mm -hmm. We had this running like really well before this thing started. So the, the first thing we have to do is gather some uh, network information, some IP addresses of our host. And then we're going to start to uh, attack the network. This com particular computer is connected to a network that we have. It's part of the cybersecurity lab, which was mentioned before. We have uh, significant infrastructure, all virtualized, so that kind of like Vegas, we can do whatever we want there, and it doesn't leave. Uh, so we can attack systems, and we can break them. What are you doing? It's thinking. It's thinking. So while it's thinking, what's that? OK. This is actually what it's like, okay? Again, on TV, it's like, oh, we, we start this stuff up and we just do these attacks and it takes no time. We actually have spent many, many hours putting this together so that it would run smoothly. And it's not. But it will, trust me. Um, let me talk about the program as to kill some time, stall a little bit here. So again, a Montgomery College program, we have a two-year degree in cybersecurity and networking. What we teach are the technical tools that both uh, Mike and Clark referred to uh, earlier, the technical skills. How do you uh, build networks that are secure and operating, install operating systems and secure them against attack? Because as they pointed out, the real target is the data that these companies have. Uh, they mentioned how you know the large companies, you think of them as a truck company, but they have tons and tons of data. And the real, uh, the, the real treasure chest, the treasure trove, is the data. That's what everybody is after. Uh, and as a user uh, at home, of course, you want to protect your own systems. But uh, what attackers tend to go after are users within organizations. They want to gain access to your computer because you may have something of value, of some, uh, something of interest to them. But the real target is going to be that network that you're connected to. Uh, a common attack is called a pivot, where I gain access to, to an internal machine, and I use that internal machine to gain access to uh, all the other machines on that, that organization's network, and possibly get the credentials so I can gain access to some information. So what we're doing now here is, uh, what Chris is doing here is starting up the enumeration. He's actually connected to a network, and he's going to scan the network, and he's going to find hosts that are connected to this network. And with this tool, he'll also be able to determine what vulnerabilities these systems may have. This usually takes a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes here. Uh, but what, else, what you'll see here is uh, the screen will start populating with systems connected to this network. It'll identify the operating system, uh, and it will identify some of the things running on those devices. And by knowing what's running in the version, we can determine what may be vulnerable, at which point we can uh, begin our attacks. Takes about two minutes. Um, 
Montgomery College, as I said, has a two-year program in cybersecurity and networking. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit later about the, the UMUC program. Um, they have the, uh, the a four-year degree in, uh, in cybers. And they have, we have a great arrangement with them that we're partners for this event. They have a um, continuation um, scholarship. Right? Continuation scholarship. I can't keep all these words straight. Uh, but anyways, graduates of Montgomery College and any community college transfer to UMUC and they get a great deal and you'll learn about that if you go and speak with the, the counselors and advisors here. There, we go. there it is. So now we've identified all of the uh, systems on this network and we've even found some uh, systems that are vulnerable. So. Now what Chris is going to do, he's actually going to target one of these mach uh, machines and gain access to that machine. Uh, now, you may have heard, I don't know if anybody's heard the term script kitty. Uh, a lot of these tools are available and unfortunately there are th some people who will take these tools and target systems, target networks. Uh, we call them script kitties because they really don't know what they're doing. They don't understand what's going on. Um, but this is a tool that automates a lot of the attacks makes it easier to identify systems that are vulnerable and how they may be attackable. So at this point, uh, Chris has identified a machine that is vulnerable and he's going to exercise one of the attacks against it, at which point he'll have access to the machine and he can do pretty much whatever he wants on that machine. As you can see, it's uh, the, the penguins, for those of you who are not familiar, the penguins uh, are associated with the Linux operating system. What the tool has done is it's, a, it's assigned or it's a, determined the operating systems of these machines. Uh, you can see the ones that are obviously Windows. The one that he's working with right now is a Linux machine. Um, and it's the tool has identified what it's vulnerable against and now uh, by simply exercising a couple of commands, he now has access to the machine. In the lower pane, you see he has root access to the machine. So now he can do whatever it is he would like to do on that machine. Even with the delays, it took us a couple of minutes. It took him a couple of minutes. Now, again, in the real world, it takes a little hard, uh, a little longer. What we have to do is gain access to the network. Uh, but once you gain access, which is actually not always the hardest thing to do, uh, enumerating networks and gaining access, it's really not that difficult. So now we're going to switch gears and switch attackers. We've, we've gone from uh, Chris to, to Jason. Um, one of the common threat vectors, as we call it, are users who get spam, uh, get email with uh, a link or a file in it. Our attacker, uh, Jason, is targeting our victim, Dan. And he has sent Dan uh, an email. In the email is a link. Or actually, if you have your email up there yet, Dan? Oh, yeah, so I, this may be a little hard for some of you in the back to see. But Dan's looking at his email. He got, in, in Gmail, he got a, an email from, uh, from Jason over here. And, you know, it looks pretty harmless. It looks like it came from Montgomery College Cyber Center. Uh, we have competitions that we hold for our students as well as others. So this is basically an invite. Uh, and he's also sent him a link to download a PDF, uh, which what he'll do is click on the link and open up the PDF. And it's actually very informative uh, and helpful. Now Dan is getting uh, a document that in it has um, the Hacker Playbook. This is a common book used by several classes where we teach, again, the tools that hackers use. And see, he's going to open this up, and there you go. He's now got access to the, or he's looking at the hacker playbook over here in a PDF form. Well, the interesting thing was that the email that was sent to him was, uh, included the link, but it was the, the PDF file had an, uh, some malware embedded in it. And while he, when he clicked on it, what happened over here was Jason was able to create a reverse shell, a reverse TCP connection. Many organizations, your home computers, 
in your home firewalls, they allow you to connect from your computer out to the internet. Your firewall is going to block anyone trying to connect into your machine from the internet, the same with any corporate organization. What we've been able to demonstrate here, or what Jason has been able to do here, by having Dan, the, 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 uh, the victim, open a file, he created a reverse connection. So now his machine created an outbound connection to Jason's machine. <laughs> and by doing so, Jason's able to connect and then gain access to him, his machine and do pretty much whatever he wants. Again, going through the machine and trying to find any inf interesting information, the data that maybe he's an important person in his organization and he's got some data that might be of interest. Or maybe he's on a larger net, sorry, uh, on a larger network and on a larger network that uh, he has access to, to data from that organization. <laughs> so he's in, so now uh, Jason's connected to Dan's machine and Dan doesn't know and, he, and he's not any the wiser. He's actually now going to look at the hacker playbook and start preparing for one of our competitions. But Jason goes through his machine up here on the big screen here and he's looking to see what his computer name is, uh, what version of uh, the operating system, he, an operating system he's running. And he's going to, and the next thing he would do is actually create himself a machine, uh, an account on that machine so that he can go on then and just access it whenever he wants without um, Again, Dan being any the wiser or the organization he works for. Now, again, these tools are, are not tools that you should uh, just randomly play with because they can be quite dangerous <laughs> and break machines, but should you decide to pursue a degree, you'll actually understand what all of this means for those of you who may be uh, new to this field. And what he's doing now, he's going to start dumping usernames and other information on this machine so he could uh, possibly attack other machines or other users within that, within that organization. And again, the target really doesn't know any of this is happening. We're going to move, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to move along here, and the next thing he would do is actually create a terminal session in there. And again, he's already accomplished that. And uh, for to save some time here, we're going to move on to our next thing. We're going to we're going to change gears a little bit here. We've talked about uh, the tools that you would learn in, in on either of our programs. Uh, the next thing we want to look at is something a little closer to home. Uh, anybody here have a, a cell phone? And I, okay, right, you have self, I know it's a silly question, I'm just trying to see if you're still paying attention. Um, anybody here have Wi-Fi at home? All right, another silly question. Um, how many of you here who have a cell phone and who have Wi-Fi at home, when you walk into your house, your cell phone connects to the network at your house? Right, and you do that because you want to save on your data charges, right? Um, well, while we were all sitting here, we actually started collecting what your phones do when they're not at home or not at work or not at the, pl the place you frequent, they send out what we call Wi-Fi probes. Some of you may recognize some of your networks up here on the right side of the screen. Um, your phone is sitting here trying to connect to your home network. and we're gathering that information. I've, I've been asked before, you know, you know, we do these demonstrations, would you break, how about if you break into somebody's phone at the demonstration? Uh, and usually, several people, including Jesse, will say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. And we don't. So we're not doing that, but we are gathering the information that your phones are now sending out. 
And I can see several of you, I think you're turning off your Wi-Fi now, right? <laughs> now, you might think, well, that's no big deal. So my Wi-Fi might be up there, and uh, who cares if anybody knows what my home network is called? Well, if I think there's a tab up there. Isn't there a tab up there already for the, the wiggle net? No? Are you still on the remote machine? Or are you local? There you go. All right, there is a tool we have access to. And I can take an SSID and I can put in there. Now, there are some people uh, who have decided they're going to catalog the SSIDs that they find. And this site has actually cataloged about five and a half million of them. And you can put in an SSID and you may, what's that? I'm sorry, thank you, 500 million of them. So uh, what I've done here is I started this, uh, on the left side of the screen you can see I've narrowed the search down to Maryland. And I was watching these earlier. Try putting in, uh, in the search field, uh, 11163. I'm not sure you can see that very well from in the back, but we've entered an SSID that came up on the, on the, huh, I may have to log in again. All right, I'm going to give the, I'm going to give the microphone to Dan for a moment and he's going to tell a joke. <laughs> there are 10 types of people in the world, those who get binary and those who don't. Well done, Dan. All right. All right, so now he's going to put in that uh, SSID that I asked him to find before, to type in before. And what it finds down there is, oh, there happens to be one, and there's a link to a map, and that's where that SSID exists. So just by gathering SSIDs, phone, uh, uh, these Wi-Fi probes, it is possible we can figure out where your home uh, network is. Try uh, Madden, M-A-D-A-N. And I see here there are several SSIDs out there. Click on the first one. All right, and that one is, uh, oh, Wilmington, Delaware. Well, someone, may, someone in the room may frequent someplace in Wilmington, Delaware, or try one of the other links. This one's north of Baltimore. So the point we're trying to make here is that by gathering this information, we could potentially figure out where you live, where you work, where you're frequent. And if we really wanted to, uh, we could kind of profile uh, of the things that you do. And simply by gathering this information, which is flying about freely in this room, although it's slowing down, like I said, I suspect that many of you have decided to uh, turn your Wi-Fi off. One, before I fall. One last thing I want to show you. I'm going to go back go back to this one. I think Clark mentioned it earlier. Well, Clark, Clark mentioned earlier, he asked many organizations or people at organizations if they have uh, what the passwords are if they change the default passwords on their devices at work. Hmm. Here we go with passwords again. Uh-oh. Now you all see one of my passwords. Dan, you got another joke? <laughs> so, I asked earlier how many of you have home, oh. Wi-Fi at home. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, and how many of you who have Verizon or um, Comcast, they've provided you a device which you have, um, you either use or maybe you went out and you went to Best Buy and you bought yourself your own in, uh, internal Wi-Fi router. Anybody done that? Set up your own internal Wi-Fi router? All right, well, 
several things you do when you connect to that thing is you connect and you define the network. You define who can use it. You define some passwords. And of course, there are some other things that you're supposed to do after you do those things. And of course, everybody does that, correct? Well, with this site, what we can do is we can actually identify things that are connected to the network. And by things, I mean things other than, uh, let's say, web servers, database servers, etc. those things that we expect to be accessible uh, on the internet. Now, if you've done everything you're supposed to, then you won't have any issues, but there are several people who don't quite do all the things that the documentation tells them to do. This might take me one or two effort, uh, tries here. And hopefully this person has done what they're supposed to do. And they have, good for them. So what I've done here is I've done a search of a very common home Wi-Fi device that is accessible, that you can connect to from, from the internet. And the first thing I did was simply got a username or, and password prompt, which means that they didn't go and, and, and disable the access to, from the internet. The second thing they didn't do, Clark's gone, they didn't change the default password. So now what I've done is I've gained access to somebody's Wi-Fi device in their house simply because they didn't follow the, the documentation and disable the service uh, or change the default password. I won't do anything at this point. Uh, I don't want to make anybody unhappy with me. All right, so we showed you uh, three or four things here. Uh, and both Clark and, um, Clark and, uh, what's that? Mike. Yes, thank you. I'm really bad with names. <laughs> Both Clark and Mike talked about the technical knowledge that you need when you get in an organization and those people who are in high demand. We've demonstrated four things here. They're all very different. But again, I want to go back and say that you know, if you attend someplace like Montgomery College or University of Maryland, University College, you'll learn how these things work. You'll learn how to do some of these things. Uh, and, and at that point, you'll be very valuable to some organizations that uh, need to have their devices and, and their infrastructure secured. Thank you. Oh, right. Uh, we're going to bring Mike back up now. We're going to do the, uh, the panel discussion. Um, I think we have, is everybody mic'd up? No? All right. So we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Now we're going to have uh, two former UM, uh, you two former Montgomery College students, uh, one a former uh, a grad from uh, UMUC, and a couple of uh, business people are going to come up, and we're going to have a uh, panel discussion. So give us a couple minutes here while we uh, get ourselves set up. We are now going to begin uh, a really interesting panel.
that I think is super well-rounded. Everybody from a student uh, to somebody who's graduated looking for jobs. Um, yeah, chair, right? We've got employers, we've got alumni, um, and we've got career services. So um, come on up. Um, each of them is going to uh, individually spend 90 seconds or so talking about their background, their name. Um, I'll move this way so I can look at everybody. And uh, we will do a Q&A. Nikki, how much time do we have? I'm going to stand. Perfect. That's okay. No, no, it's okay. Um, you know what I'll do? I'm actually going to stand here. This way I'm not in the view of everybody, but you folks are. All right, so why don't we start down at the end. Just say your name and say a little bit about it if you've got 90 seconds to go through that. My name is Conrad Shan. Um, I graduated from UNUC in 2017, December 2017. Uh, I worked for Adventist Healthcare. Uh, Doing their IT in their IT department, imaging IT department. Uh, I have a family. Uh, I play volleyball regularly. That's Are you good at it? <laughs> I would some say what well, I'm pretty good for a short guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Conrad. Please. Hi, uh, Sam Maroon. I work for a Department of Homeland Security. Um, started out as an electronic warfare officer, Air Force. So electro, uh, basically countermeasures. Um, graduated from BMI engineering degree. Graduate work was a little louder, please. Yes. Oh. Uh, I'll speak up. Yeah. I can. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just real quick. Uh, graduated from BMI engineering degree. Uh, master's MBA. Uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, got started in electronic warfare the Air Force, uh, then got into IT after I got out of the Air Force, uh, done everything from uh, database management to network analysis, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and currently I work for uh, Department of Homeland Security, I work for the Hunt and Incident Response Team, so I'm um, one of the Hunt folks that you had mentioned earlier. So um, a lot of the technical questions, if you want to throw those up here during the uh, question and answer, just uh, please do. Cheers. Good. Um, my name is Chris. Son, uh, I graduated from Montgomery College uh, with associates in cybersecurity as well as networking. Uh, before that, I was a lifeguard and pool manager. And before that, uh, I was working on a master's degree for theater at Villanova. So it's been a strange ride, but uh, <coughs> ultimately ended up, uh, I think, where I want to be and at somewhere that's really awesome. So thanks to Montgomery College. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. And 50% of college students change their majors at least once, so your journey is not at all unusual. I'm Dr. Francine Bloom. I'm Assistant Vice President of Career Development at University of Maryland University College. I've been in career services for about 25 years. My name is Jay Powell. I'll support your claim. I was pre-med with a medical sociology degree and uh, changed. So. Uh, I've been in the industry with the intelligence community for about 26 years. I started out at uh, Fort Meade and Langley uh, counterparts, and then about after six years in, went contractor route. Um, I have no relationship with any of these colleges except that I hire from these colleges. In fact, uh, my particular, I hire 142 students a year when they're sophomores and juniors, and whoever had the clearance question, I'm the guy that clears you, right? I clear you while you're still in college and I'll leave the rest for the Q&A. Come see him afterwards, there you go. <laughs> okay, so let's start the opposite way. Let's start right off with you. What do you look for in a particular student, above and beyond degree? If all things are equal and these 10 all have the same degree, what, what else are you looking for? Well, I hire from three walks of life. I hire from junior, through senior, and I hire you based on your grades, aptitude, and your ability to shake my hand and look me in the eye. When I'm hiring you when post-college, if you aren't in my internship program, but you're in my hire program, I look for the degree, I look for the grade point average because that's the screen. I use that because I don't need to know exactly how you were in each of your classes, but college well-rounded you. When I look beyond that, I'm looking for internships, 
I'm looking for desire, and I'm looking for knowledge in the field. Many come to me with cyber degrees and can't describe what they've learned and therefore don't have that focus. That's a great answer, actually. But pay attention to that, right? Um, it's not going to be much different, if at all, if he was the CIO or CISO of McDonald's or Ford or Deloitte or Disney. It's very, very similar. So there's, there's an even message to take back from here. Wish we could have recorded what he said, because pretty much across the board, that's what they're looking for. So Francine, let's go to you. Um, what are the employers who partner with UMUC Career Services looking for in candidates to fill their cybersecurity and information? What do you hear the most often? So that, that's a great question, and I think we've heard some of the answers already uh, in this presentation. Uh, they're looking for the degree, they're looking for experience, and they're looking for certifications. Uh, to have a Security Plus kind of right off the bat is a, a good entry-level one if you're looking to be more in management, a CISSP. Uh, but I think what you're bringing up is really important, the ability to look someone in the eye and the ability to be able to express what it is you bring to the company. So I'm, I'm going into career advisor mode now. You're, you're not there to, you're, you're not asking the employer to help you out. You're there to talk about how you can help an employer solve a problem. So be sure you've really looked at those job openings that they have and match yourself to a particular job opening where your skills and experience and certifications are a fit and be able to express how you are a fit for that position and what you have to bring to the table, what you have to offer. If you can't articulate that in your resume and an elevator pitch when you're first meeting the employer or in an interview, you're, you're gonna be hurting. So you need to be able to express what it is you've gotten out of your education program, your experience, et cetera, and what you bring to that employer. I think those are two really good uh, points for folks that are looking for it. The other thing I'll tell you is, um, in my position, investing in co-building fast-moving commercial startups, both here in Silicon Valley, there's this misnomer that people say, ah, I don't want to work for the government. I don't want to work for a big corporation. I just want to be a cool coder working in a startup with flip-flops. Well, let me tell you, that doesn't exist. You work with people. You have to look them in the eye. You have to get along with them. You have sprint schedules, 12-hour days. You have to have a higher EQ, right? So employers, as well as startups, are looking for people who can do more than just have a high GPA and have a piece of card. Because it's all important, it's all stressful, it's all fast moving. So keep that in mind. It's, I, I'll call it the other 30% of an interview. It's that important, right? All right, Chris, let's get to you here. This is a, this is a good one because I loved your background, so I wanna, what made you choose the program here? Um, it was actually by chance uh, okay. entirely. I was working as a lifeguard and I realized that it was not fulfilling. Did you save the life of one of the professors and that's how you ended up there? <laughs> yes, but in a different respect. Got it. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, no, it, it, was, it was not fulfilling and so I decided to come back to school I took a range of classes and landed in a, um, basically an intro to cyber security class. And from there, I said, this is really fascinating. This is absolutely worth my time. This is a direction that I want to head in. So I committed from there to finishing the program. And then as, a more, as the more I got into it, um, you know, the more I participated in things and the more I realized how this is, uh, is really, broad and incredible and a growing industry that absolutely needs more people, so. That's great, that's great. Sam, let's, uh, let's talk about what suggestions can you give candidates and students who are looking to transition their current career into a cybersecurity field? Very good question. Um, during, I, I guess during the break, I was able to talk to some of the students. Um, I talked to one fellow, I won't use your name, so I won't put you on the hot spot, but uh, he was transitioning from accounting, um, and his background was accounting, and he wondered where he would fit within cybersecurity. And, and uh, there, there, there are a couple ways you can go. Um, my background, I, I basically tried to touch every aspect of IT before I just kind of stumbled into um, the cybersecurity realm. 
and I was, I was very fortunate, but it's very important that, to finish the education so you can get that foundational knowledge. Um, programming, networks, understand what a, a transactional database is, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that the formal foundational is, is very, very important. And then from there, you can either, uh, from what I've seen in the industry, you can either go vertical in certain areas, uh, like HIPAA or, sure. or certain types of security areas, um, and or you could go into more of a broad spectrum where you're a cybersecurity, uh, uh, you, you're like, for instance, with the Hunt and Incident Response, where you have to understand uh, the full gamut of IT uh, and then be able to hunt for the bad guy within each one of those areas, whether it's networks or whether it's on the hard drive or, or he's hi he or she is hiding uh, in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I would say the foundational knowledge, and then from there you can, um, make your transition and find out what you like to do because during an interview um, for a certain vertical area um, expertise, you can tell if a person uh, likes what they're doing uh, versus, uh, and, and is educated in those areas, has decided that's the area that they want to focus because there are different facets or whether they don't. That's I think that's a, a great answer. Um, one of the things that has been really weird about the last four or five years, and it's wonderful at the same time, you see where Sam talked about some people can go straight up in a vertical, maybe they want to be a CISO someday to get a well-rounded, somebody wants to stay in the SOC and, and the hunt management. We even have CISOs, CISO at Disney, jumped from Disney into one of a startup, a fast-moving startup, right? Want to get out and do their own startup at 45, 48, 50 years old. We have uh, people who are 45 years old Seven-year lawyer at Ernest & Young said, I hate my job, I love tech, I wanna go back and get a, a degree in cybersecurity, right? So that's the beauty of it, there's no constraints. And the field has gotten so big, you, you could work, you could build an entire career on one niche area in cybersecurity. Um, it's, it's a fascinating time. All right, Conrad. How did your classes at MC prepare you for UMUC? Well, um, originally I was working in the banking industry prior to becoming in, coming into MC and IT, and of course the banking industry crashed, and so they laid off all of us. But at the time I was going, and I graduated from MC with an associate, associate's degree in uh, network engineering, which landed me a job at, in a radiology firm. What MC does is give you a base, a base of all the things that you need to get into the tech world. And that will help you move up and faster than most other people who don't have a degree with a, at MC. That's, that's a great answer. All right, so um, I'm gonna give you kind of a, a hot seat type of one. Okay. Um, when you're looking from an employer's perspective for government, we, we already discussed the, the clearance thing, you, you know, that, that's, that's handled for you. Are there particular things beyond just degree or particular areas in a degree as an employer you're looking for in students? Yeah, um, so there was a discussion about certifications. A colleague to the right of mine said the same thing. That becomes critical, in fact, the jobs that we're trying to fill, be it from systems administration, database administration, actual red or blue team attack groups, gray hat monitors, all need to have, at a minimum, the DOD 8570 level two, which is security plus. That's a given. There is no work for you with administrative rights without that certificate. Not gonna happen. In addition to that, we look for what you have done with your time while at college. What classes did you take? Did you take those bare minimums? What did you get out of those classes? When we start interviewing you, if you were hired as a junior or senior, or if we're hiring you afterwards, we're trying to find that niche because cyber is huge. Cyber is everything. Everything has a cyber component. And the, it, it's so broad that if we don't know where you want to go, and if you don't know where you want to go, it's very hard for us to place you. Someone may say, I want cyber, when they really want is policy. And there is such a thing. 
Some people think cyber and all they think is attack. Some people think it's all defense. Some people think it's, I'm going to do a normal job as a network admin or a sysadmin, but you've got to have cyber, otherwise you don't know how to secure the system properly. And you're going to have the other cyber people all over you all day long so you don't know your job. So knowing what you want out of cyber, knowing what you want to do, and us evaluating what you've done with labs in your own time, and by no way am I uh, promoting you stealing your neighbor's Wi-Fi or doing something silly here. I will tell you that's the number one question I ask you on the polygraph. Have you ever stolen something electronically you weren't supposed to? <laughs> Two-year delay, right? So doing appropriate exercises, learning on your own time, understanding what you want for cyber is the most important for me to place you in a job in my company. That's, that's great insight. That's more particular to the national security space for sure. Um, but you'll, you'll find this, whether you're interviewing for a place at Hershey or Ford or Disney, and this is where he brought up a key point, things you're doing when you're not in class, clubs you're involved with, projects you're involved with, um, are you interning at a place? It begins to shape for them and for you where your interest lies, right? All right, Francine, this is a fun one. I like this, and it's an important one. Describe UMUC's reputation with employers. Why are UMUC graduates so in demand? It is a fun one, thanks. <laughs> our students are really in demand and our alumni are really in demand, not just because of the outstanding education that they've gotten at UMUC, but also because our students tend to be adult learners. So if our average age is 31, that means that you've got some life experience. Now, it's very important when you're transitioning, if you're changing careers, to make sure you get experience in the field before you graduate, if you possibly can. If you're a grown up with a family and balancing your job and your kids and, and your school, it's hard to do a traditional internship. So you have to look for other ways of getting experience, non-traditional opportunities. And we have some of those at UMUC. But our employers especially like that our graduates are a little more mature. They're a little more well-rounded. They're a little more committed. They're a little more focused. They know what they want. They can be relied on. So that's another reason. Along with the outstanding education, it's just the life experience and the uh, insight and the wisdom that our slightly older students bring to the table. Great. I like that. All right. Chris. What advice would you share with uh, students who are looking to consider and to attend MC to prepare for a career? Just, you know, top three things that you would tell them. If you're looking to prepare to come to MC to do the cyber program, uh, I would highly recommend that you look into online resources. One of the great things about this industry is that Everything is already out there on the internet for you to learn at least the basics of. Uh, if you are interested or have a remote interest in networking or cybersecurity, there's great resources. YouTube has a bunch of channels where there's Red Hat hackers who will show you and walk you through um, kind of exploits. Uh, there are other sites such as Cyber IT, which has basically courses that you can take which may you know, transfer over into things that you will actually learn at Montgomery College. So that'll put you ahead of the game. Uh, and then there's interactive websites uh, that are useful too, like uh, overthewire.com, which will actually give you some hands-on experience with doing some of these things. For example, one of them is basically teaching you the basics of Linux administration and using uh, the Bash shell. So really, if you're thinking about this, and you're interested in it, take it, the initiative and go out there and learn about it on your own. The resources are available on the internet. Uh, that would be my first step for you. That's great. That's a, that's a really good point. All right, Sam, from, from having such a varied degree, you know, a, a career where you've touched so many different parts of the stack uh, in IT and now cyber, where do you see it going today where kind of the big gaps need to be filled talent-wise. I know there are gaps everywhere, but from your perspective as an employer, where are you having the biggest pain point? Yeah, that's a really good question. That, uh, that's, a, that's a long answer, I'll try to shorten it. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the gaps. Um, gaps actually open up every day. 
uh, the, the, the technology changes so quickly that uh, there are gaps that you didn't see coming, the unknown unknowns, as they say, and so on. Um, currently, there's, uh, there are gaps within all the technical areas, um, whether it's uh, pen testing or whether it's um, forensics, deep forensics, uh, network analysis, uh, and also managing um, those processes. Matter of fact, whenever there's a, uh, if there's ever uh, an incident or, or a hunt, it's a project. And, and in that project, you're going to find gaps within the system as well. Um, I could go through so many different gaps, uh, whether it's legacy systems. You know, we, we, we have folks that uh, there are still mainframe systems out there, computer systems that, that are f set within uh, a circle, uh, just to, just to figure speech, but within a circle of new technology, uh, and there are gaps there with the mainframe because some of the folks that used to work the mainframe systems are are are, are, are no longer uh, with um, you know they're retired and so on. And then you look at some of the newer technologies, are like uh, let's say let's say the cloud, uh, cloud security. There are gaps right now. We're trying to learn uh, more about cloud new security, languages et cetera, et cetera. popping up. New languages, yeah. etc. So. Uh, to, to belabor it, I, I, I would have to say the gaps are, are too many to, to really mention. Uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's right. Answer. I wanted to go through the exercise from your perspective, though, of just hearing how anywhere within cyber, there's no place where they go, yeah, we're good. We got, we got enough people covered it. It's just uh, the world's your oyster once you go through this, this area here. Yeah, once you, just one go ahead. quick uh, point, and this is just, just a pitch. Um, you could surpass, I've got 25 years in, in the industry, IT and so on, but with those gaps you could surpass my knowledge almost overnight if you find one of those gaps and they're able to capitalize on it. Just keep that in mind, uh, especially when, you, when you're going to college. All right, Conrad, what would you, uh, what kind of a, one piece of advice would you share with prospective students um, who are considering attending UMUC? Do it. <laughs> so mostly what, just do it because if, you, if you're having trouble in your career and you're tired of, you know, not getting paid enough, go back to school, get it done. It's fairly simple. I mean, I'm, I'm it's hard, fairly simple but hard at the same time. If you have kids and family and responsibilities, Yes, but you can make the time to do it. It's not that difficult. That's a great answer, and that's, that's quite true. Okay, we got time for one more before we get out of this, and I'm gonna go to Francine, because this is always an interesting point. Um, what tips do you kind of share with students who are looking to transition their existing career, right? I mean, it's a, you, you talk to somebody, I got a master's in this, and I'm an attorney, but I really want to do this. Uh, that's a little different proposition than uh, you know somebody who's just coming in young. What kind of tips do you share for them? You know, not unlike Conrad. You know, wife, kids, job, craziness. Well, it's very important to know the field, and as my colleague was saying, it's important to know what it is that you want. So identify the kind of role that you're hoping to fill and make sure that you get yourself that skill set. You're going to have transferable skills, things from your other life. So the gentleman coming from accounting, you could do cybersecurity at, at an accounting firm, at a bank. Uh, we've got GEICO recruiting at our career fair coming up on March 7th. We have Navy Federal, and they're recruiting for cyber. Coming from a law background, you know, those are the, the kinds of analytical skills, the thinking skills, the legal understanding, the policy implications. You have that to then sell to an employer. So look for employers and roles that could capitalize on that kind of experience that you already have. But also be aware that you're not going to be able to start at the same level you were in your old field. You are going to need to start lower down, more at the bottom. So again, get as much experience as you can before you graduate in as many different ways as you can, whether it's competitions, whether it's gigs, whether it's volunteering. You know, go to your local, go to your local church or your school and ask them if they'd like you to do a security audit for them on the house. You know, that's something you can then add to your resume. It's <coughs> resumeable experience. Start building that resume in your new field. Have a vibrant LinkedIn profile. 
post articles that are relevant to your field, comment on articles that are relevant to your field. Know whether or not you're going to be able to get a security clearance because there are plenty of jobs for people without clearances in private industries. So again, we're looking at banking, healthcare, retail. Um, but if you're not going to be eligible for a security clearance, you're not going to want to waste your time with the government contractors and with the federal government, for example. So just know really what it is that you have to offer and be able to match yourself. And of course, your career services offices, whether at Montgomery College or UMUC, can always help you with that. I think that's great. Well, before we, we finish, I, I will tell you something that's really, really interesting. Um, so far in 2019, the two fastest growing salaries in corporate America, believe it or not, are occupational psychology and cybersecurity professionals. So if you are jumping from a current career, I can guarantee you your salary over time, your compensation over time is going to be higher than what you're doing today. Uh, and I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. So let's give the panel a hand for their time. Appreciate it. Another round of applause for the panel, please. We can also thank you, Mike, so much for being our host today. You can thank Mike, please. And we'd like to also really extend on behalf of UMUC appreciation for Montgomery College for hosting this for us today. We really appreciate that. I'd like to thank each of you that are joining us here in the room and for those of you joining us online as well. And the panelists are going to be joining us in a few minutes for questions. And what I'd like to do is turn it over to Joe who's going to share about some more activities that are happening. Thank you. So um, uh, as, as Nikki said, we're going to have the panelists will stick around. We'll stick around for some questions. If you go outside this, uh, leave the room, <clears throat> go to your right. There are two rooms. One has Montgomery College advisors and counselors that can tell you all about our program. The next room is full of UMUC advisors and counselors that can tell you all about their program.